Stanford University. Good evening, everybody. I'm Charles Yonkerman, Dean of Continuing Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the first in our second year of the series, Pioneers in Science. Uh, these events um, celebrate the lives and accomplishments of Stanford faculty members who have received Nobel Prizes, National Medals of Science or Technology, and MacArthur Fellowships. Subsequent events in this year's uh, lineup include uh, anthropologist Bill Durham, who received a MacArthur Fellowship, coming on November 4th. That's the second of our fall events. In winter, Nobel laureate uh, Doug Osheroff and National Medal of Science awardee Stanley Cohen. And then in spring, the two final events of the year, National Medal of Science awardee Pat Supis, followed by Nobel laureate Roger Kornberg. It's quite a lineup. And as you'll see tonight, each of these events is introduced by uh, the awardees, um, an awardees colleague who is uh, eminently distinguished as well. So you get eight uh, Stanford um, distinguished scientists um, in this year's lineup. Special thanks uh, to Pat Devaney, uh, the series uh, founder and director. Pat is former associate dean of research and director of the Office of Science Outreach. To Greg Priest, the series uh, research director. To Azeen Masudi, our events and communications manager, who's undoubtedly out in the lobby. And to Paul Costello, whom you'll see on stage tonight. And a special thanks to our financial co-sponsor, the Stanford Historical Society. And before I say a few words to kick off tonight's event, I'm going to put in a plug for the Historical Society. The brochures um, for the Society are out on the table in the lobby. Uh, you do not need to have a formal affiliation with Stanford to belong. All you need to do is care about the university, its past, its present, its future, its mission. And in addition to the brochure, I hope there are still some of these flyers for the Society's first public program of the year. It's going to be an interesting program. What does the Board of Trustees actually do? <laughs> Something those of us who have been here for 25 years, not quite sure about. But we'll get an answer on October 27th uh, from Leslie Hume, the current chair of the board, and Bert McMurtry, a past chair. And again, this event is open to members and non-members alike. October 27th, 5.15 in Annenberg Auditorium. And if you want more information, you can find the Stanford Historical Society website very easily, I'm sure. We are pleased and honored to have Professor William F. Sharp, the Stanko Professor of Finance Emeritus and 1990 Nobel Laureate in Economics with us tonight in conversation with Paul Costello, the Executive Director of Communication and Public Affairs in the Stanford School of Medicine. As is our practice, Tonight's program will be introduced by a distinguished colleague in the honorees field. Following the introduction, Paul and Professor Sharp will join in conversation for about 45 minutes, after which we'll open it up to the audience. There are microphones in the aisle, as you can see, and we ask that you please do use the microphone so everybody can hear the question. You may notice that this event is also being videotaped. Uh, you are, uh, if you choose to uh, pose a question, um, only your voice will be recorded, not your image, because the cameras will stay focused on stage. Finally, uh, please turn off your cell phones. Okay. So uh, tonight is my privilege, privilege to introduce uh, James Van Horn, the AP Giannini Professor of Banking and Finance Emeritus in the Graduate School of Business here at Stanford, who will in turn introduce Professor Sharp. Uh, Professor Van Horn came to Stanford in 1965, where his teaching and research have focused on corporate finance, mergers and acquisitions, corporate restructuring, fixed income securities, and government and nonprofit debt financing. He was the very first recipient of the Distinguished Teaching Award from the MBAs and received it again in 1997. Quite an honor to be picked twice for that award. He's the author of five books, many articles. Three of those books, Financial Management and Policy, 
financial market rates and flows, and fundamentals of financial management are used all over the United States and internationally, and two of them are in their 12th editions, which is quite handsome. Among his many honors and leadership positions in the world of finance, uh, Jim Van Horn served as the president of the American Finance Association and as deputy assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury. Please join me in welcoming Jim Van Horn. Thank you, Charlie. Um, <clears throat> it's been my privilege to have known and to know Bill Sharp for some 40 years. And this evening, to be able to reflect on his remarkable impact on finance academics and on investment managers worldwide. The zest with which he approaches research, and for that matter, really life in general, uh, can best be summarized by a quotation from Mark Twain, and I quote, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did. So throw off your bow lines and sail away from safe harbor. Bill's a sailor, incidentally. Catch the wind in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Bill is always exploring, dreaming, and discovering new things. Perhaps he is best known for the capital asset pricing model, uh, known simply as the CAPM. This model is based on the notion that uh, security prices are largely determined by investors who are, hold multiple securities. That is, they are well diversified. The important risk to them, then, is a risk that cannot be diversified away. In market equilibrium, a security will be expected to provide a return commensurate with its unavoidable or systematic risk. The other portion of total volatility can be eliminated by the well-diversified investor and therefore doesn't really enter into the security's equilibrium price. Now the unavoidable risk of a security and a portfolio of security is, is captured mathematically by the sensitivity of its return with the return of the overall market, the overall security market, the S&P 500 often being used for that purpose. The beta, closely associated with Bill, of a security is simply the slope of the relationship between these two returns, that for the individual security and that for the overall market. First published 45 years ago in the Journal of Finance, the, CAP, the CAPM gradually at first, but then in an accelerated fashion, literally shook the academic and investment communities. It's an equilibrium theory, which allows a security to be priced on a risk-adjusted return basis and in the corporate world for a cost of equity capital to be determined. Now, as often occurs with a game-changing idea, the CAPM has had its detractors, some of whom have argued that beta is dead. However, the model has stood the test of time. Beta is resilient and the CAPM is still the standard that is taught in business schools worldwide. Bill has had a very large, has left really a very large imprint on how investment performance is measured and how it is evaluated. Early on in 1963, in connection with this movement, he published a sophisticated mathematical algorithm for determining the efficient set of securities with the highest expected return relative to volatility, as measured by the standard deviation. This was the start of an assault, clearly an assault, on subjective and anecdotal measures of investment performance, which occurred in the pre-SHARP era. Performance now was measured quantitatively. A simple example of a quantitative approach is the SHARP ratio, widely used today and really in the lexicon of every money manager. It's defined as a portfolio's actual return in excess of the risk-free rate, frequently the Treasury bill rate, divided by the portfolio standard deviation of return. A reward to variable, I'm sorry, a reward to variability ratio, if you will, first set forth by Bill some 40 years ago. He was an early and a strong advocate of investment performance being judged relative to an appropriate benchmark. It's not enough to say that a portfolio manager has earned a positive return. Does he or she provide a return in excess of what is provided by the benchmark portfolio? Style analysis, where style of investment strategy, such as large capitalization growth, 
mid-cap value, quantitative, quant contrarian, owes much of its emphasis today to Bill being its early champion. One thing that style analysis does is provide a quantitative approach to finding an appropriate benchmark. In addition to a number of articles and many, many talks, Bill's highly respected investments textbook furthered these ideas. Over the years, the objectivity by which investment managers are evaluated as to performance has increased many fold, thanks in no small part to the missionary zeal of Bill Sharp. There's a Chinese saying that a bicycle never stops, it only falls down when you stop. Bill never stops, uh, even after his early acclaim as one of the most creative and stimulating financial economists of the 20th century. Though he never received full credit for the idea, he really was the first uh, to set for a binomial approach to option pricing. This approach is the most widely used method today for valuing options on stocks, options on bonds, on mortgage-backed securities, on commodities, and on other instruments. This type of idea has received a Nobel Prize in the past, uh, needless to say, for option pricing. Another example of the creativity is the application of option pricing to deposit insurance. The notion is that there is an incentive for management of a depository institution to increase volatility through investing in riskier assets and or increasing leverage or taking highly risky derivative positions. If things turn out favorably, management through bonuses and equity compensation benefits handsomely. If the bet doesn't pay off, the downside is bounded at zero, and the institution is turned over to the deposit insurer, usually the taxpayer is backing that. So heads we win, tails the taxpayer, and not we as management loses. This concept is applicable to a number of financial situations, and really I think explains much of the behavior in the mid part of this decade when debt was priced so cheaply in the marketplace. Gambling with other people's money. A branch of Bill's family emanates from the state of Maine in a small town there called Bucksport, which is in the Penobscot Bay region of the state. There's a story of an older gentleman in that town who, on his front porch in his rocker, was interviewed by a reporter from the Bangor Daily News. And he was asked if he'd lived in Bucksport all his life, to which the gentleman replied, not yet. <laughs> And so it is with our honoree this evening. If he were asked the question, have you done research all your life? While well, most people in my vintage no longer do serious research, this is not the case with Bill. He keeps plowing ahead. Uh, his present work on retirement uh, finance is creative as well as novel. It offers much insight into investment and spending behavior, both normative and prescriptive, for people planning for retirement. And this you might expect from the creativity really that Paul says through his every vein. Not surprisingly, he's received a lot of professional recognition uh, for his work, the Nobel Prize, of course, but a number of best paper and outstanding contribution to the field awards. And he also served, he has served as president of the American Finance Association. From a personal standpoint, uh, I and my colleagues at Stanford Business School have benefited probably the most from our interaction with Bill. He has been a superb colleague, full of ideas and stimulation on a host of economic and finance topics, and this transcends to PhD students that we've had in finance in the past. It truly has been a privilege to have him as a colleague and as a friend. Well, I could say much more about Bill. Um, like an Egyptian mummy, I'm strapped for time this evening. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to the premier event of this evening, namely a discussion with Bill Sharp. Thank you. Did you know about Bucksport? Well, I, I've never heard that story. Um, my, uh, I will tell you, my 99-year-old uh, great uncle, who was a mailman, sleigh in the winter, etc., uh, bachelor, chopped his own wood, um, was determined that he would make it to 100, at which point he would not pay his income tax. Because he, you know, he used to say, Franklin Roosevelt, well, I don't know what we're coming to, makes me tremble. Uh, he was very conservative. 
and he didn't make it to 100, but I think that's what kept him going at least till 99. <laughs> so that may have been, I have no notion, Jim. By the way, do you see why Jim is and was one of the best teachers that the Stanford Business School ever, ever had? <laughs> I wanted to start with asking you about, when we met a few weeks ago, you said that the family's business, your family's business was education, and that you gained your love of learning through your parents, and, and you told really great poignant stories about your parents. Can you share with us how your parents instilled that learning in you, that love of learning? That is, if I can remember what I said a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> um, my family was impacted, as you might imagine, I was born in 34 by the Second War. So my parents came to education, as did my stepfather, in, in kind of midlife. Uh, my father had been a um, student in the classics, more or less, at Harvard, had spent his year abroad on scholarship, sampling life in Europe, primarily, and then had gone back to Harvard working in the personnel office. Uh, he was in the National Guard, and so a year before Pearl Harbor, he was called active duty. We moved to Texas the day after Pearl Harbor to Vallejo, here, there, and everywhere. He, uh, after the war, went to work for the Veterans Administration in San Francisco uh, in personnel and started teaching at Golden Gate, then college. And I'm, I'm delighted I have some students and a colleague from Golden Gate here. Um, and then in mid-career, in mid-life, took a PhD in education at Stanford. He then headed a small school in the Midwest and then came back to Golden Gate as president. My mother, during the Second War, was in retailing. And then after the war, she had a degree from Pembroke, uh, went back to Pomona and uh, got a master's and an education certificate or credential and then ended up as a, an elementary school uh, principal. And my stepfather, in mid-career, having worked at the county garage, uh, took the bar exam by teaching himself out of uh, correspondence courses and became an assistant DA and a public defender. So he was not in education per se, but they all partook of it. You mentioned the war and also when we spoke a few weeks ago, you talked about the imprint that the war had upon you, the imprint that the war had upon your friends, but also the imprint that the war had upon education in America. Well, um, I think, I, I guess perhaps the, the thing you may be alluding to uh, when we moved to Vallejo, my father was in the anti-aircraft um, to defend the shipyard. Uh, it was impossible to get housing. There was this huge influx of military into the Vallejo area. And the school was on double and at times triple sessions. So the teachers would teach one group of kids in the morning and then another totally different group in the afternoon. Uh, I moved many times and I was ahead two grades, and I was ahead one grade, and then I was ahead again, and then I was behind. Um, I guess the, the thing I remembered most was that when I moved to Riverside in Southern California, uh, I was in fourth grade, and uh, it was a spring, and they tested me on my multiplication tables. This is a little bit ironic. Uh, and it turned out in Vallejo, they only went through 10, which seems fairly sensible to me now. In Riverside, for some reason, they went through 12. And I had not memorized my 11s and 12s. So I flunked, and I was made to repeat fourth grade for my sins. <laughs> so, Giving great hope so, to every so child. That, it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty crazy time. And of course, a very tragic time. The other thing that um, you couldn't stand the sight of blood. Yes. And your mother wanted you to be a physician, a doctor. She did but that wasn't going to be the cards. And, and economics was. What did you love about economics? And when you spoke about it to me, you spoke about it very passionately. And the word that was used earlier was a zest. And you spoke about it really very deeply. Um, well, in my time, there was no such thing as economics in high school. So I had no notion when I started college at Berkeley, actually, uh, what economics was, and, and my mother did want me to be a doctor, and um, 
I didn't really like chemistry or physics all that much, nothing personal, some of my friends in the audience. Um, so to make a long story short, I transferred to UCLA where I thought a business major would be super. And I took two courses, beginning microeconomics and accounting, which was really bookkeeping. Absolutely loathed and despised accounting, but I thought economics was, I don't know what the word, probably swell then, but I now would say it was cool. I just thought it was lovely how you could make these perfectly plausible little assumptions about behavior and choice and then aggregate and get these unexpected results as to how things work in the larger economy um, under those conditions at least. And I like the poetry of it. I know it seems odd to associate poetry with economics, but I do. Um, what does I, that mean, the poetry of it? <clears throat> I think it's just aesthetically appealing. It's, you know, you, these sparse assumptions, um, nice little graphs. Like, I'm very graphical, so I love the graphs. And, you know, you get the intersection, and then something comes along, and there's, a, there's less oil, and, you know, and the price goes up in order to ration it, and all these things that you don't see when you're buying and selling, but nonetheless happen in the larger economy when you put it all together. So I thought it was aesthetically appealing. Uh, I thought it was practical. I had no notion how I was going to earn a living, uh, but I changed instantly to an economics major. You actually failed the job of getting a job as a bank. I as did. A bank. I did. When I was... Um, Which was a good thing. Yeah. When I was finishing my senior year, I went out to interview and I thought, well, what am I going to do with an economics degree? I, I suppose work for a bank. And I interviewed two or three bank people in LA. And um, typically the interview would go, well, hmm, I see you have very good grades. And initially, not knowing better, I would say, yes, yes, I do, bashfully. <laughs> and, uh, and then they'd say, well, why don't you go on to graduate school instead of wanting to work in my bank? And one of them finally told me, it's, no, it's not the A students that we like to hire, it's the B students. <clears throat> and uh, I tried the last interview or two, I would reach over to the resume and turn it over and say, look, I was in a fraternity, I was commodore of the sailing club, I'm actually a human being, you could hire me. But they didn't. So I got a master's degree, then went into service, and then uh, later on got a PhD. I wanted to ask you about two important people in your life and that was Fred Weston and Armin Algian. What was it about these men that was so important and as mentors, and what did they teach you about mentoring? Uh, well, Fred, who tragically died just uh, a few weeks ago, <coughs> Fred uh, was trained as an economist. He was in the business school in finance at a time when finance was pretty simplistic, I, I might even say moronic. Um, <clears throat> and it, it really didn't have much economics in it, much theory, much really serious empirical work. Um, Fred hired me as his uh, research assistant, one of many actually, he was kind of a factory. <clears throat> so I, I worked closely with him um, and then found that I could take one of the five fields for my PhD, even though it was in the economics department, I could take in finance. So I took finance as a field. Fred was just a dynamo. I mean, he just, and he was so organized. He would teach a seminar by going in with a, a recorder and dictating his next book, uh, in effect. <clears throat> he, would, he would have the graduate students take a subject and teach the class the subject, and Happily, uh, he thought that this work by this guy named Harry Markowitz might be something I'd like to teach to one of the classes, which I did. And therein lay uh, a story. Uh, but he was just fascinated with ideas, and, and his goal was, he was one of the very early people to say, let's bring the traditions of economics to bear on subjects which involve time, money now, money later, and uncertainty, money now, maybe money later, 
and mainstream economics really didn't deal with either of those issues, time to some extent, uncertainty, not much at all. But he wanted to bring rigor and the habits of, of economic theory to the field. So that was very, very influential in, in my life. My other mentor was very different, Armin Alchin, uh, who's still living, um, basically would ask the fundamental questions and make it simple. I remember uh, his microeconomics PhD seminar. He taught us that 95% of economic literature is not worth reading, and so therefore he wasn't going to have us read any, which I had to take the course from someone else later to learn something about the field. But he started off, so, you know, musing on, you know, why don't we buy babies instead of have adoption, and pros and cons thereof. I remember several sessions in which he was trying desperately to figure out what profit really is. And, and there with Armin, he was basically watching a brilliant mind wrestle with tough practical problems. So it was more, I guess, technique. And again, I, I can't tell you he taught us to do this and that and that, but it was sort of an osmosis process. Um, both remarkable men. Did you, did you, what did you learn from them about when you later mentored people? Were there any specific things that, that you, that stuck, that, that remained? <clears throat> well, I, I guess, as in, I sort of, I, I critique my own work, as, mm -hmm. as I think many researchers do, uh, but what I would do is say over and over again, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, try to play devil's advocate, find other approaches, and try to reduce things to the simplest possible terms, and say, okay, you, you did this model, and you got this result, and here's this formula, and here's the derivative, and blah, blah, blah. What does that mean in terms that you know, anybody on the street could understand? You know, and and uh, that's a hard test, uh, but I think it's a useful one. Your Nobel Prize came out of work that you first did on your dissertation, but you initially we're working on a dissertation in an entirely different area. Tell us about that story. Um, well, it's, it's, it's serendipity 1A, I guess. Um, I was at the RAND Corporation and um, had become interested in a subject called transfer pricing. Very simply, you're a big corporation, the widget department makes widgets and the gadget department takes the widgets and adds something and produces something else with them. So department B, uses the output of Department A, and corporations at that time were trying to establish some sort of inner accounting, internal accounting, and incentive system. So A would, quote, sell the widgets to the gadget department, and the question was, what price should they sell them for so that you could evaluate the profit of both departments, in effect. Um, and that was when operations research was just coming in uh, to to prominence, and Rand Corporation was certainly one of the main places where it was being developed. So I started working on the problem, and I was using linear programming and various kinds of, of, of approaches uh, to the problem, building on the work of a fellow named Jack Herschleifer, who at that point was at Chicago. And I th had published internally at Rand my, the first 50 pages of what I thought was a pretty damn good dissertation to be. And Armin, my chairman, Alchin, said, well, Jack Herschleifer is coming to UCLA. He's going to work part-time at Rand. Why don't you go introduce yourself? He should be your chairman. Fine, says I. I did. Very nice fellow. Gave him my 50 pages. He said, give me a week. A week later, I went back, and Jack said, you know, I don't think there's a dissertation here, uh, which did not particularly please me. Um, <laughs> So I went to Fred Weston and said, Fred, what do I do now? And he said, remember that work that you liked that Harry Markowitz had done? Yes, yeah, says I. Well, Markowitz is coming to Rand. Everybody was coming to Rand that week. Um, why don't you go introduce yourself to him, and maybe you can do something with him. And so very shortly, Fred and Armin and Harry Markowitz and I worked out a deal that Harry, although not on the faculty, was de facto my dissertation chair. And uh, that's how I got into the work, which led to what I've been doing ever since. <laughs>
which I want to touch on now, and the work that you, for which you were awarded the Nobel Prize is your development of the capital asset pricing model. And like a lot of great ideas, the capital asset, the basic idea behind the capital asset model seems sort of obvious that riskier assets should offer better overall returns than less risky assets. What was it about the capital asset pricing model that really made it so important in the development of finance? Uh, <clears throat> well, let me sort of go back one step. Uh, prior to Harry Markowitz, there was this notion of risk. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it got about as sophisticated as don't put all your eggs in one basket. And I remember a reporter asking Harry, we shared with Merton Miller, the prize in 1990, you know, is, are you got, did you get a Nobel Prize for saying to put all your eggs in one basket? <laughs> to which Harry said yes, and the reporter wandered off puzzled. <clears throat> <clears throat> and therefore confirming, you know, Dick Taylor and his view and that of the other, uh, quote, real scientists that year that this economic stuff, you know, didn't really have a Nobel Prize and didn't deserve one anyway. Um, but any anyway, Harry said, let's quantify risk. Jim mentioned standard deviation. That's a measure of risk in the sense of the width of a probability distribution of sort of a portfolio, whatever the totality of the things that you might have in your investment portfolio would be. Um, <clears throat> I then did what, in the dissertation, and subsequently expanded on what anybody trained in microeconomics would do. Uh, if everybody does this, what happens when they all come to market and prices adjust and the market's clear? What Jim referred to as equilibrium. <clears throat> and what I found was that under some very, very simplifying, very rigid simplifying assumptions, that yes, Virginia, there would be higher expected return for higher risk, but as Jim said, not just any risk. If there were higher expected return for higher risk, we'd all go to Tahoe and have a good time and make a lot of money. The risk for which there will be a reward if the markets are functioning at all well, we may want to talk about that, um, is, <laughs> is risk that, as Jim said, cannot be diversified away. Um, now, I like to, when I try to motivate people for the results of the CAPM, those, those results, those implications, I quite frankly now in that and other work prefer to start with Ken Arrow's view of the Arrow de Brew view of the world, which I won't bore any of you with. Uh, I think the result is a little bit more obvious and, and is in many ways more general. Um, but the basic idea is if you want money in times when money is scarce, then you're going to have to pay more for it up front. And if you pay more for it, your expected return is going to be less. That's sort of the, the core. So there's the two big implications are first, yes, Virginia, there's a reward for bearing risk, but only non-diversifiable risk. The second implication is, why do you want to bear that non-rewarded risk, which says, for God's sakes, diversify. And that's really the intellectual basis for index funds, which I suspect many of you, most of you have heard of and many of you may actually invest in, which are basically funds that just buy a whole lot of securities and keep the costs as low as possible. I want to come back to index funds in a few minutes, and I want to touch on one other aspect of the fund. If I, if I understand it correctly, the fundamental lessons of capital asset pricing models are three, diversify, keep your transaction costs low, and make sure if you buy a risky investment, you are adequately compensated for the risk. Can you expand on those? Well, <clears throat> the first, you know, we, we'd like to say sometimes in general audiences, you know, the principles of real estate, three principles are location, location, location. In some ways, in investments, it's diversify, diversify, diversify. Um, costs, um, quite frankly, the it's sort of the Lake Wobegon thesis. The average investor cannot beat the average investor <coughs> before costs. And if you're out trying to find hot stocks or the best new growth fund manager, 
or listening to Jim Cramer, whomever he may be, <coughs> um, you're going to end up bearing extra risk, on average not getting any reward for it, and spending a lot of money in the, in the bargain. Um, so that's sort of that aspect. Um, I've forgotten now number one and number three. What was number three? Because I was going to number three take umbrage that, at number three. Number three was that you... Um, Lost my papers now. Um, that 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 the return of the investment should be. Um, I've lost my. Papers. Oh, you should. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Diversify your assets. Keep yep. your transaction right. costs low, and make, make sure, sure if you yeah. buy a risky investment that you're <coughs> adequately compensated okay. for it. Yeah. Okay. That's what I wanted to expand on a little, or, or argue with you. I don't know how you want to take it, but um, what the theory says, uh, at least broadly. If you take more, let's call it market risk, economic risk. In other words, if you put yourself in a position to do really badly in bad times, think of it that way, then in some sense you should expect, and that's a mathematical or statistical concept, to do better. Or another way of saying it is in the very long run maybe you will do better. <coughs> but that package gives you higher expected return and greater risk. And in any given period, and this could be a period of a month, a year, 16 months, like the 16 months we just went through, ending in February, where almost every equity investment fell 50% in 16 months. So if you take risk in the pursuit of higher expected return, you could get higher return, you could get really higher return, you could also get your head handed to you. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of people forgot that. Um, so, yes, maybe in the long run you're going to do better by taking risk. And you can just put it simply. Just put your money in the bank. Well, I used to say where there's no risk. Um, <clears throat> let me restate that. Uh, I would say I'd be tempted to say in treasury bills, but who knows there either. <clears throat> but, but. Something like that rather than, than even a diversified equity portfolio. Let me go back to the index funds because I wanted to ask you something further about that. You suggest that people ought to invest more of their money through index funds and less through traditional actively managed mutual funds. What's the difference between the two strategies and why is index funding a better approach for investment? Um, well, that, that story came out of things like the capital asset pricing model. You know, not very complicated little mathematical models, but, you know, mathematical models nonetheless. But as is so often the case, uh, you can find that you can get the same conclusion much more simply. And, and so let me just share with you. Uh, a number of years ago, I published a little op-ed type piece in the magazine of the Financial Analysts Federation. So basically 150,000 practicing investment people read this because it's their professional magazine. Um, it was called The Arithmetic of Active Management and it was embarrassingly simple and the argument is just very, it's very simple. Uh, let me just play it with you if I may, if you'll indulge me. <laughs> Imagine that everybody in this room collectively hold all the securities in, let's say, China since we have somebody from China. Um, it's, it's not a very well-developed mind. That's okay. It'll work. <coughs> and we're going to divide you into a third over here. That are, you're going to be index fund managers. Got Jim in the right place. And over here, the two-thirds of you, you're going to be what we call active managers. And I'll tell you what you do. What you do is really simple. <coughs> you just find out how many shares are outstanding of every security in China. And if you've got 1% of the money, you buy 1% of every single company on the Chinese market. And you all do the same thing. Okay. You do research. You learn about companies. You study industries. You visit plants. You, Lord knows what you do, but you find the companies that are really cheap. <laughs> and you disdain the company, companies that are really expensive by your lights. You do the same, you have different research, you have MBAs from Stanford, you have MBAs from Harvard, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> so you do your things. 
And we call you active because periodically you change your mind and you sell things and buy things so the brokers like you and you get good seats at football games. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so you guys are active managers, you guys are passive managers. <clears throat> a year passes, the average, the total Chinese stock market returns, I don't know, 10%. Before costs, what does Jim get? Quick, quick. 10%. 10, 10, 10, okay. What do you get? 20. What do you get? Minus 5. Over there is somebody who actually short stocks, whatever that is, and lost 80%, what have you. So you guys are all over the map. Question, before costs, what is the return on the average yuan or renminbi in this side of the room? What is the average return before costs on the average yuan or renminbi in this side of the room? You got it. After costs, these guys are cheap. They don't know anything. They don't do much. These people are expensive. They've got degrees from prestigious business schools. They do all this research. And the difference is something like well, Schwab just announced they've cut their index fund fees on a couple of index funds to nine cents per year per hundred dollars. The average manager over here is going to charge a dollar per year per hundred dollars. So after costs, the average yuan or renminbi over here must, 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 must underperform over here. And here's the irony, if you, if you sort of think that through and say, well, maybe I'll get the one who's so smart over here that they can overcome their costs and beat the market, but then again, maybe I'll get him. <laughs> <coughs> so let's all go over here, but then the whole system breaks down because we need these people to be doing their research and keeping the prices reasonably in, in line with, with prospects. So it's a kind of a public good problem in which these people provide a great service to keep markets reasonably well functioning so these people can ride for free. It's a free rider problem. <laughs> and I've, I've worried over the years that if I say this to too many people, some of these guys will move over here, but they never do. Yeah. They never do. Why, why don't I mean, they? You read, you know, I mean, look at all these. How many of you have seen... You know, stock picking magazines, I don't care if yeah, it's right. Forbes, Fortune's doing it now, business. We, here's a hot manager, here's a hot strategy, here's what's going to win next year. Bull. Just total bull. If markets, I mean, markets would have to be crazy to make it possible for somebody to write an article in a magazine, let alone somebody to read an article that others have already read and ex ante do better. Ex post, somebody's, some of these people are going to beat these people. But ex ante, you're better off over here. But don't tell too many people. <laughs> Traditionally, economists have built their models on the assumption that people behave rationally when they make investment decisions. And recently, economists and psychologists have challenged that notion, challenged that assumption. Is the assumption of rationality, is it an accurate picture of human behavior? If it isn't, is there some reason it's still worth building models based upon rationality? Oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, it takes a certain amount of bravery to appear before you this time of the world. Um, I just finished a book, which actually is very good, by Justin Fox, who's quite careful. Uh, but the uh, publisher titled it The Myth of the Rational Market. And then it goes on to something like how Jim and I destroyed the world or something. I'm not sure what. Uh, and there's a whole spate of things. Uh, there has been a strand of research, which we now call behavioral economics or behavioral finance, that goes actually way back, of which I might say I've been a fan. And I will say that I do work with Cognitive psychologists, um, uh, as a matter of fact, have a project going now with a recent graduate of the psych department, PhD, here, and a colleague in London. Um, Dick Thaler and Cass Sunstein, his co-author in the book Nudge, which I strongly recommend, by the way, it's very accessible, um, talk about economists who build models of worlds populated by econs whereas he builds models of worlds populated by humans. Um, and uh, without any question, the idea that w 
in my work and the work of people who do what I do, we've never assumed people knew what was going to happen. We have assumed that they could come up with a list of what might happen and assign reasonable probabilities to those different alternatives. Um, so we've never assumed omniscience, but we have assumed you know, a degree of predictive power that, that certainly not everyone has, perhaps no one has. Um, that being said, to go to your last part of your question, uh, I did some work uh, that culminated in a book a couple of years ago in which I built this, for me, very complicated simulation program where you can create people, give them information, and let them trade with each other, and then look at the properties of the equilibrium. Um, and, and I was struck uh, and I, with the fact that you can build a world in which I have some of the information that's available, Jim has some, you have some, you know, but we don't, no one has all of it. <laughs> I may process it reasonably well, you may process it very badly, you may process it even worse, but in a world in which you got enough people where somebody has at least some of the information that's available concerning what might happen in the future, uh, even though nobody's anywhere near perfect and nowhere near rational in, in common parlance, you can end up with security prices, security prices being quite similar to those if everybody had all the information and processed it right. Now, what you will not end up with is people's portfolios or investment strategies being the same as if they all shared the information and processed it right. And so um, my belief, and I've devoted a certain amount of activity over the years in the real world to trying to help people, institutions, and individuals uh, make sensible investment decisions because you know anybody who knows anything about how individuals and institutions make investment decisions knows that terrible things are happening out there unless the markets are absolutely insane. And indeed, <clears throat> you can't really justify the way this investor runs money and the way that one does and the way that one does with any possible combination of what the prospects are. So, so uh, I think sort of the bottom line is I'm comfortable with the two big implications of the CAPM and subsequent theory, much, much subsequent theory that we've talked about. You're probably not going to get rewarded even in expectation for bearing risk that you can diversify away. And uh, you really ought to diversify widely and keep costs low. I wanted to ask you about bubbles and how we should, in recent years we've seen a lot of bubbles. We had the internet bubble, the housing bubble, and it seems like bubbles have always been with us. And one of the basic premise of classic economics is that markets tend toward equilibrium. So do bubbles disprove this premise? Well, this will be self-serving, but at least some of the models in which some of us build say, well, at any given time, given predictions, here's how those predictions will result in prices. And you may get to that equilibrium, but then information will change. Something will change in the, in the environment, in the external environment, and then you have to start, the markets have to start moving to a new equilibrium. And I think most, most of us say when we're teaching this that you don't really ever probably get to any equilibrium and the equilibrium you're moving towards changes from time to time. But if you don't understand what would happen if you were to get there, you, I would argue, don't have a clue as to, as to how to understand the actuality. Um, the, uh, you know, bubbles are, are interesting. Everybody can identify a bubble afterwards. <clears throat> um, but, I, you know, uh, Bob Schiller, who's one of the, the really creative uh, behaviorists, I would call him, um, after Nixon was impeached, uh, did a survey, very carefully controlled, to find out how many people had voted for him. And it turned out, you know, only 10% of a very carefully constructed cross sample yeah, right. had voted for Nixon. <laughs> and, 
and yet somehow or other he'd won the election. Um, so we all have selective recall. Uh, I remember just before the internet bubble burst, being at a sort of a conference of uh, non-economists mostly, and they were asking me, how can you justify these absurd valuations for companies in Silicon Valley? My answer, for what it's worth, was, well, it could be that there is a small probability that the Googles and Yahoo's, I guess it was Yahoo at that time, the Yahoo's of the world, uh, will totally wipe out businesses that have been around for centuries. I may have probably didn't use General Motors or uh, <laughs> Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers as an example. <clears throat> and if, in fact, that happened, these companies really would be worth one huge amount of money. So maybe the market is factoring in a relatively small probability of, of a great outcome for these companies, and a probably large probability that's not going to be so wonderful. Um, but I did, thankfully said, but don't put all your money in these. At most, put no more money in these than they represent today in terms of market value vis-a-vis -vis the broad market. Um, now, of course, those who put less than their representative market value at the time in would have done a lot better than those who did even that. But um, so I, do, I, you know, as as you say, bubbles, and and I used to say nobody can predict bubbles, but Bob Schiller got two out of two. He very vocally and in print and in books predicted the tech bubble, and then he predicted the housing bubble. Um, so. Uh, um, you know, maybe, just maybe, he's the exception, and, and uh, I try to stay in close contact with Bob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wanted to ask you to step back a bit, and your fellow Nobel laureate, Paul Krugman, said that the Great Recession was a result not only of lax regulation in Washington and reckless risk-taking on Wall Street, but also of faulty theorizing in, the, in academia. Is he right? And, and what do you think that economists can learn from this era and the mistakes? Well, Paul, in, his, in the initial column, in the op-ed piece in the Times, uh, where he nicely summarized Justin Fox's book, the one I told you about, did reference Justin. But in the long op-ed Sunday, Sunday Times, Times magazine. I, as I recall, he forgot to right. mention Justin. Uh, which is not to say Paul hasn't said that before and, and since. Um, I think there are two issues. A lot of that debate, if you will, and maybe it's no longer a debate, has to do with macroeconomics. Now, I'm not a macroeconomist. I have read some of the work by uh, George Akerlof and Bob Schiller, again, um, and, you know, the debate between, but, but just, just simply put, there was Keynes. And following Keynes, there was a sort of an anti-Keynes movement in macroeconomics, which had some of this efficient market, super rational flavor that Keynes said, well, look, and if you get in trouble, government should spend a lot of money and do a lot of stimulation, et cetera, et cetera, to get you out. Keynes uh, being the, sort of the intellectual giant in economics during the uh, 30s. And then subsequently, people said, well, no, wait a minute. If people in the markets know that if we get in this kind of trouble, the government is going to do that, then people will have already taken that into account and it won't work anymore. I'm, I'm really oversimplifying, uh, but that's about my level of understanding of the field anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and so a lot of what Paul and others are saying is, is really an attack on the assumption of hyper-rationality, if you want to call it that, in the macroeconomics literature, Bob Lucas being sort of a Nobel Prize winner, uh, kind of a clear case in point, I think. Um, on the financial economics side, which to me means investments and derivatives and the kinds of things Jim Van Horn does, um, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, but uh, I think my simple view of it is that, as, as Jim very nicely put it, um, 
if you have people who can win and maybe win big by taking a lot of risk and not lose or not lose much if it turns out badly because either they just go on to another job or you and I, the taxpayers, bail them out, uh, then you're going to have two things. People, to the extent that they can get away with it legally, will take a lot of risk. And uh, you do that by borrowing a lot of money, by using leverage, either explicitly or implicitly. And on the way up, it's a great ride. And we've all seen what a great ride it was on the way up for lots of institutions and individuals. But then when things turn bad, it can get very, very ugly. Now, we knew this in the traditional banking industry. And we regulated. We insured, we regulated, we inspected. And while that process is far from perfect, that's not really where the problem was. What happened, those clever people in the financial industry, <laughs> many of whom we trained, uh, found ways to do that sort of thing in what is called broadly the shadow banking industry, which was not regulated. And indeed, it is less regulated, or was until recently, than it had been just a 10, 15 years before. We actually softened what little regulation there was in a number of domains. Um, and so financial people did what financial people do. They're really smart. There are a lot of very smart people in this industry, and they figured out a way to take a lot of risk so that if things turned out well, they'd become fabulously wealthy. And if they didn't, eh. And for the biggest ones, you and I will bail them out, have bailed them out, are still, to a non-trivial extent, bailing them out. And uh, I, there's something desperately wrong in that. So if you were a regulator today, are there one or two things that you would immediately do that really are, you know, things that are really stuck in your, about immediate action that you would take if you're a regulator? Well, the simple things are capital requirements, disclosure, standardization, <coughs> um, trading things explicitly where there is some hope of figuring out what they might be worth because transactions are taking place for derivatives with regard to investment banks and, and hedge funds and what have you, um, requiring a certain amount of capital, which limits to some extent the risk, um, and not allowing certain you know, leverage somehow measured below such and so. But to be perfectly frank, um, it's just not a fair contest. No matter how dedicated the people in the regulatory institutions may be, they're just, they can't compete. They can't move fast enough to deal with these very, very, very smart people who go into big finance. Um, and so I'm reluctantly uh, joining, the, the, have joined the camp that says if it's too big to fail or too systemic to fail, then it's too big or systemic to exist. You've got to find some level and say, we'll regulate everybody as best we can, but nobody from now on out gets bailed out. And since we know that if you're too big or too interconnected, that's a hollow threat, we just not let people get that big and connected. And will there be costs? Yes. But I, I, and again, I, I have no notion how you'd do it. Uh, what about but, executive compensation? How, what do you, how do you think that should be attacked? Um, well, it's easy to say it's a kind of a sideshow. Uh, it certainly is a motivating force on the part of top executives in terms of the risk they take in their organizations. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I should tell you, you might as well know, I'm a knee-jerk liberal Democrat who believes free markets are, can be really helpful. <laughs> and so I'm... I'm I have nothing but cognitive dissonance. I'm <laughs> schizophrenic. I don't know what I am or where I am. Um, but um, ask me the question again. I was, so in, I was so embarrassed to tell you that I've forgotten where I was going. Let's go on to it. Okay, never mind. 
One of the things that you, uh, you, when we spoke before, you threw out sort of a hand grenade that I'll lay out here tonight. And you said that under existing social security systems, seniors don't bear their fair share of the risk of economic downturns. And I wondered if you'd expand on that. The, okay, this is, this is know, let me, let me. Your mother didn't want you to be a physician, nor did she want you to be a politician, clearly. I'll tell you one more story about my mother since you brought her up again. After the, after the market crash in 1987, <clears throat> somebody in the Wall Street Journal got hold of me. I was in an airport somewhere, a payphone, as I recall. And they said, well, how do you explain the fact that the stock market dropped 20 percent in one day? I think that's what was the Jim. Uh, depends on which part of the stock market. And I said, well, and then I said, well, I don't know, but it's really weird. Whereupon the Wall Street Journal published, you know, my one-line comment, William F. Sharp, you know, that was pre-prize, but, you know, distinguished professor at Stanford says, it's really weird. And my mother, <laughs> my mother said, three degrees, nine years in college, and, so, and what, all you can say is it's weird? <laughs> Okay, full stop. Back to the question, which is... The question was about bearing their fair share of it. Yeah. Seniors bearing. Um, so, so, well, years ago, and it's been several years ago, uh, it occurred to me that when you think about Social Security or Medicare, uh, or more broadly, the division of the pie between those who are working and, in a sense, produce it, and those who are retired and, in a sense, you know, are living off the production of those who are producing the pie. When you think about that division, we had a system under the old traditional Social Security and the old kind of pension where you made no decisions, you went to work, you retired, you got a check, you died, your spouse got a check, you know. In that regime, if the pie shrunk, for example, as it has in the last, in this great recession, um, the old folks said, not my problem. <laughs> I've got my checks, and if they're Social Security, they're indexed for inflation, no problem there. If you're in CalPERS or a public defined benefit pension plan, indexed for inflation. And that that didn't seem as though it was the right way to do it. If you go back to the old agrarian days when the farmers supported the old folks on the farm. If there was a bad year, everybody shared in the misery. And in some sense, when you had 10% of the population retired, let's say, maybe that worked. So the risk was borne basically by the workers, to wildly oversimplify. And the retired people didn't bear much of any economic risk. But as the demographics move us inexorably, to 15%, 20%, in some countries, more than 20% retired. It just is not an efficient division of risk. There has to be, in some sensible societal arrangement, some sharing of the risk of bad times by the old folks. Not proportionately, perhaps, and not by everybody. Some old folks can choose, perhaps, to bear no such risk. Others can choose to bear proportionate or more. but. The old rigid system just didn't seem to me to make any sense. So, so I concluded in the early 90s, really, that the move from the traditional pension to 401ks and things of that sort, kind of pension system that we've had at Stanford forever, uh, where you put money in and you decide within limits how much to put in, uh, what you get in retirement depends on what the investments are worth that you, to some extent, chose. That kind of system is going to eventually dominate at least a substantial part of retirement saving. Um, what is the right breakdown? I don't know. Should people be allowed to put all their money in stocks or in an oil fund? I kind of think not. Uh, some of the things I do in industry, I get some glimpse into what people really do with these kinds of plans. And, and it's, it's appalling what people do. They put, you know, half or more of their retirement savings in the stock of their own company. So if you work for Enron, uh, 
or General Motors, you know, well, I have bad news. <laughs> well, you've lost your job, you'll never find another one. And the other bad news is your retirement savings are worth nothing. That's crazy. That's nuts. And, and, and then they put their money in mutual funds that charge high expenses and have absolutely no track record or any reason to believe in the future they can outperform these folks. So uh, people, may, and they don't save enough. It's, it's just, it's a, there's a whole litany of horrors. At events like these, how often are you buttonholed about personal investment decisions? Well, <clears throat> uh, I've gone through most of my adult life having people ask me for the hot stock, stock tip <clears throat> or the best mutual fund. And that always elicits my little thing. Well, I've devoted my life to building models which show that neither I nor, for that matter, anybody else can answer that question for you. <laughs> Go over to this side of the room. <clears throat> um, but I've noticed recently, uh, to the extent I dare talk to groups like this, um, that people are not asking that because I think you now understand financial economists are the last people <laughs> you want to ask to predict the future. <laughs> Let me, uh, before we take questions from the audience, I wanted to ask you two questions. Uh, one is, um, the day that you won the Nobel Prize, did you have any clue that this was about to unfold, and how did it change your life? How did that day go, and, uh, and, and how did it change your life? Um, <clears throat> the day the call came, Kathy, my wife, who's next to Jim Van Horn here, and I were uh, at a conference in Tucson, and the phone rang at 4 o'clock, and a very, somebody with a quite thick accent said, well, I'm pleased to announce that you have won the Nobel Prize. And I thought, yeah, sure. You know, which of my colleagues thought this was really funny. Um, and there was another complication. Some guy wanted me to talk in Europe, and he'd been calling it inopportune times. Thought it might be him. In any event, so we turned on CNN, and within five minutes, they carried the story. And I would say it was about 60% right. You know, they had some of the names of Harry Markowitz, Mark Miller, our affiliations wrong. But every five minutes, they would get it closer and closer. So we we finally figured, now, to your first question, did we anticipate it? No. I had not even pay, in paying attention to the fact that it was the time. I think those of us in financial economics had pretty well figured that our field would not be included by the committee in the definition of economics, which perhaps they rue the day now that they did include it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for a couple of reasons, people passed over, et cetera. Um, so I just hadn't thought, you know, that, that I would have even had a shot at it. Um, and we had this lovely, we sent for room service, and we sat on the little patio or deck outside our room. We watched the sunrise over Tucson. It was very calm and quiet, and then all hell broke loose. Um, so it certainly changed our lives then. Um, uh, it did not change my life at Stanford one iota. My colleagues had no more respect for me afterwards yeah. than before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they did start saying almost instantly, well, what have you done lately? Um, <laughs> the um, uh, for quite a while, I would get, well, you get asked questions about things you know nothing about. And as some of you may know, once in a while, uh, a Nobel Prize winner will actually think they know something about which they know nothing and, and embarrass themselves and others. I mean, most of us who, who are so honored have been working, hopefully deeply, in a very, very narrow area. And so we're about the last person to ask about disarmament. Um, <laughs> I remember I had a call from an Italian journalist a few days after the announcement. And he said, well, what do you think about should Russia do this? And, you know, some of the, <laughs> and, you know big European questions that European journalists want to ask. And finally, he said, well, do you know anything about anything interesting? <laughs> and, and I said no, and he hung up. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I try to, uh, try to stay in my area. You do get invited less so now, you do get invited to uh, give talks to groups. And, and whereas before, when you were invited to give a talk, it was, will you speak about the capital asset pricing model or debt securitization? And, and, but the, very often the invitations are, would you come speak about whatever you'd like to? Um, 
which uh, is a lot nicer. There are a number of young students in the audience, and I wanted to ask you if you had one piece of advice to a young person thinking about a career as an academic economist, what would that be? Well, I'm, I'm too far out of touch with the industry or profession to, to know how different it may be now. Um, obviously, I, mean, I, was, I was in the perfect place. First of all, I was born in a year when very few people were born. So uh, there wasn't a lot of competition, no matter what you wanted to do, uh, <coughs> which was very helpful. Plus, there was this huge, huge influx of faculty positions because of a huge influx of uh, students post-war. Um, so academics was a growth industry in, in my era. Um, it was, it's, it was a it was an incredible career, you know, and, and if, if it's even a pale shadow now of what, what it was uh, in my era, uh, I would say, why would you ever want to do anything else? Um, now, I did try to keep one foot in the real world and one in academics. Sometimes I get a little more weight on one than the other, both because I wanted to test some of my academic ideas in the real world and influence people who made real decisions. And because knowing something about the real world, I thought, informed my academic work. So I had it, I kind of had the best of all worlds. Um, but I think, you know, you've got you to gotta find whatever it is that turns you on, to, to be blatant about it, and then desperately try to find a way to make a living doing it. Um, and discovery, I mean, I mean, one word, why, why is being an academic wonderful? Because you get to discover things. Um, and uh, that's, that's always been it for me. Teaching is fine. Grading is onerous. <laughs> teaching is wonderful. Um, but Do you miss teaching? I, I don't miss grading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I try to teach in various forums, you know, fairly often. Um, we live in Carmel, so uh, uh, I, with a colleague, John Watson, a mathematician who's in the audience, uh, have done some work with Naval Postgraduate School, including thesis direction and teaching some operations research sections. Um, try to keep my hand in it. I, I do short course things at Stanford. Um, I view this as teaching, and, and I like to talk to I like to talk to people in the industry, um, and I like to talk whenever I can within moderation. Bill Sharp, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. I'd like yes. to bring up a subject that uh, you might regard as out of your domain, climate change. <laughs> and how well-informed markets may or may not be able to acquire the external information that we have assumed out of existence for half a century. Uh, are we going to be able to get the kind of information that we need about the real prices of what's going on on our planet here in time to make the kinds of adjustments that I and a growing number of fantastic scientists are saying we need to make? Um, well, you're, you're quite right. I, I can't answer that question. The best I could give you would be a very bad translation of what Steve Chu has told me over the years and, and some of my other friends who really know about the technical issues. Uh, but let me say something about the economic issues. Um, all the aspects I think that you're probably thinking of under the rubric climate change involve what economists call externalities. That basically I do something and it hurts you. Um, now. Ronald Coase, who won a prize uh, a number of years ago in economics, uh, showed, again, like so many important ideas, it's kind of obvious. Well, if I own the rights to pollute your air and make you sick, then you will pay me not to do it, if in fact it makes sense. Uh, or if you own the rights so that if I want to pollute your air and make you sick, then I have to pay you. And so Coase, the Coase theorem says, uh, 
the key thing is somebody has to have property rights in this activity. And at least that's a necessary condition for a reasonable equilibrium to the extent that climate change at a certain level of a certain type is going to cause devastation, somebody needs to be told, well, if you continue to do what you're doing with your coal or whatever, you've got to pay. And you've got to pay big time. In fact, you have to pay enough that perhaps if the devastation is too great, you just won't do it at all. Uh, or at least you'll seriously limit it. So we need to get property rights established wherever we can. <coughs> and there are two main approaches bruited around to this that you've read about. One is, I'll just use carbon as an example, carbon tax. You want to emit carbon? Again, I don't understand the physics. It'll cost you this much per liter or whatever the measure may be. And you pay that, say, to the government. And the government can use that to do whatever they want with it. And you set that price high enough so there is what at least you, the government slash scientists, think is a reasonable equilibrium between the good things you can get by burning coal and the bad things you get by burning coal. So there's some, some balance point. Now that puts a big burden on the government to set that carbon price. That's one approach. The other, which you've heard a lot about, is cap and trade. Uh, you say, well, I want no more than X units of carbon, and I will grant each of you who now perhaps produce some carbon, property rights to emit a certain amount free of charge. You can't do any more unless you buy rights from someone else, and if you do less, you can sell the excess that you're not producing to someone else. So they're both ways of getting a price associated with the external externality uh, and getting something closer to a sensible outcome. Um, I happen to favor, as I think many economists do, the tax because the cap and trade is open to all kinds of political shenanigans as to who gets what amounts of quotas. Um, but again, you can show that under certain circumstances you can replicate the results of one with the other, although the distribution of income and wealth can be very different. But I, I think like most uh, academics, let me say, am I am convinced that, that all these environmental externalities, we have too much of them, and it's not surprising to an economist because they're free. So we've got to find a way to charge for doing these things. And the science is going to have to tell us how much to charge, to put it again, overly simplistically. But over I have here. another question, um, sir. Yeah. I, how, yeah, the right. how do you see the reverse stocks versus uh, split stocks? Like some microsystem last year, they reverse the stocks. They have a put four in one instead of like most. Uh, how, what's good for the investor, or what's bad for investors? Okay, I'm, I'm, do I, you're talking about something called stock splits, reverse stock splits. Um, this goes way back, actually, in the literature. Um, there was this notion that if you have 100 shares of ownership in your company and you take back every share and you give them instead two shares, so now there are 200 shares representing the same ownership in the same company, that somehow or other the value of the 200 shares will be greater than the value of the 100 shares was. And you might say, well, that just shows how sophisticated economics is. That makes no sense at all. Well, it did make no sense at all. It does make no sense at all. People over the years have done empirical studies, trying as best they can for, con to control for other influences on stock prices to make that point. Um, and there are some subtle arguments, but they're, they're second, third, and fourth order. Um, that's something that people like to do, I guess, when they have nothing better to do. Uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's not a very important phenomenon either way. We have a question over here on the left. Uh, yes, when you uh, referred to index funds, I believe you were 
referring to well diversified index funds like yes, the S&P 500 thank or you. a world index fund. Yes. I'd like to hear your comments about specialized funds like a energy index fund or a financial index fund. Uh, asinine, <laughs> in a word. Um, I mean, you can say, well, if I work in the tech industry, maybe I don't want to hold a proportionate share of everything in the world. Maybe I want to be a little light on tech stocks because, after all, my human capital is in tech. And so you can say, ah, I know how to do that. We'll buy that world market portfolio you referred to, which I happen to love, uh, even though you can't find one to buy. Um, it's sort of everything out there, bond stocks, you name it. Um, but maybe I'll buy that, and then I'll take, are you ready for this, a short position in the tech index fund to basically bring down my stock tech exposure. So you can make some subtle arguments, but by and large, people use those specialized fund, energy funds, this fund, that fund, for betting. There's sort of two re things you can do in the security markets. You can invest or you can bet. And you really need to, to think about the extent to which you're doing one versus the other. If you're betting, you're betting that somebody else has got it wrong and you're able to buy something that's underpriced or sell something that's overpriced. And you're putting a big burden on that assumption. If you invest, you're just taking your proportionate share of what makes sense in terms of saving for the future, whether it's in low risk or high risk. But again, uh, when I say index funds, I mean cheap and highly diversified, unless there's a very compelling reason to do something else. And don't be fooled, there are some expensive index funds. It's hard to conceive, but there are. Look at the expense ratio uh, before you invest. Over here, on the right. Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm actually a PhD student at the business school, so maybe this will be a little more um, your area of expertise. But um, I just had a question more about academics and your experience when you introduced uh, you know, the CAPM idea, which was at the time very revolutionary. What, what, would you, what would your advice be to, to graduate students in economics or even other fields about you know, introducing a new idea that may challenge some of the establishment ideas? And how would you, you know, advise you know, younger graduate students to, to uh, sort of maneuver their way in a field where they might find resistance to some ideas that challenge them? OK, I, it, it's, my situation at that point was a little different in that there really wasn't a well-developed field of financial economics. In other words, there wasn't much of a received wisdom uh, about how to deal with uncertainty and movement over time, et cetera, et cetera, using tools of economics. Um, so to the extent that there were people thinking in that way, and there certainly were, uh, this was not, I suppose, surprising or revolutionary because there wasn't you know, a, a body of work to revolt against. So it wasn't a paradigm shift. It was, of course, very revolutionary in the investment industry. <coughs> um, another anecdote, because I think anecdotes sometimes work better. A colleague of, of mine at Stanford, Paul Kuttner, who died tragically young, um, published a book of papers called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which basically said you can't predict the market or individual securities or industry stocks or what have you. He was invited to talk to 500 people from the Wall Street establishment, an industry group in New York, and the person who introduced him, who I'm sure was fabulously wealthy, Paul was at MIT at the time, <coughs> said, well, Professor Kutner, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Whereupon Paul said, well, I have a question for you, Mr. Whatever his name was. If you're so rich, why aren't you smart? <laughs> <coughs> and, and, and it took us about, those of us in academics who tried to influence industry, it took us about five years to get over that, that one little remark uh, and, and establish contact uh, with practitioners. Um, but uh, more importantly, I mean, I, I, I do try to shake up the investment establishment. I have a paper that was just accepted that I'm revising now uh, for publication in this journal. I mentioned to you that 160,000 investment practitioners around the world get. I'm not saying they read it, but they get it. 
<clears throat> and just as they absolutely hated the arithmetic of active management piece, uh, a lot of them are going to really hate this one uh, because uh, it argues that the policies for asset allocation that almost all large institutional investors have and almost all balanced mutual funds and almost all what are called life cycle or target date funds have um, really don't make a lot of sense. And, and it's just a typical economist thing. You can't add them up. You know, it's, the, it's, it's another version of playing the game of everybody in the room. Um, but uh, at least it got through the review process and the editor loved it. So, um, so we'll see, but my guess is that's going to stir them up. But um, most academics are going to say, well, of course, it's, it's so trivial. It's, uh, you know, why do you even publish it? Um, but I would say stick by your guns. Um, the other thing I will tell you that might be your experience, although now with the internet uh, and online publication, I, I, I'm not sure how this works. I published that article. It took three years. It was rejected, by the way, and I had to appeal for new referees. <laughs> so there's a cautionary tale. If your article's rejected, don't despair. Keep trying. Um, but I published it, and I sat by the phone at the time at the University of Washington, waiting for the phone to ring off the hook, because I said, well, this is clearly going to be the best paper I ever published. may not be good, but it'll be the best I'll ever do. And nobody called. <laughs> Zero, nada. Eventually, people started trying to counter it. Um, and in that era, at least, I, I didn't realize people don't even open a journal for a year or so. <laughs> and then they read the abstracts, and maybe they, they skim the paper. So in that era, it took a long time for a paper to have any impact. Now, obviously, you put something on the internet as soon as you have the first draft. Uh, but on the other hand, there's so much to read. It's not at all clear to me that it, it may be the same. I don't know. But um, it's, it's very easy for a discipline, and a lot of the critics of financial economics have made this point, to start just getting in its own little world. And, you know, you build a model, and then you adapt the model that was built by the last guy, and pretty soon everything is sort of self-referential, and you've totally lost touch with anything useful. Um, but it's such a nice little game and a nice little world that you've constructed. Um, so I think it's always good to say at the end of the day or at the end of the article now, now, does this make any sense? Yeah, sure. These equations came from those equations and I got the math right in between, but does it really make any sense and what's it telling me and do I believe it or should you believe it? That's one of those things. That can't help me at all, but that's, that's what I would say. But over here on the left. Hi. Thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, I just finished the book Intelligent Portfolio, so I know you're involved with the company, Financial Engines. I am. And I just wondered, is there anything that came out of that data or working with a company that surprised you or altered your thinking or confirmed suspicions that you had held? Well, I don't want to make this a, a commercial. <coughs> uh, I will thank Pat, by the way, for putting my wife's website in the handout. And uh, if you haven't got one, you should get it and go see it because she's an artist, and which is what keeps me semi-sane. Um, the uh, Financial Engines is a company that a group of us started um, in 1996 to try to help individuals in 401k plans and plans like Stanford's make sensible decisions uh, in terms of investing their savings for retirement through one of those vehicles. Um, I guess I have learned, A, that it's, that it's hard to, to build, you know, a, the whole philosophy of financial engines was and is very low marginal cost so that people don't have to spend much money getting good predictions, good advice, good this, good that, um, but at high fixed cost. Um, wherein lies a, a, another story. I guess what I've learned is people really do very foolish things. Not all by any means, but as I said earlier. And to the extent that I thought that people needed help, I guess I now think they need help even more than I perhaps thought going in. Um, and uh, 
I guess the other thing maybe, standing way back, is that um, it's not as simple as we thought it was. And that's true of the field of investments, academic investment research as well. Um, here's just a, an example of that. Uh, according to the kinds of assumptions that were made by, say, large pension funds and, and others, the chance of the markets around the world going down 50% in 16 months' time uh, was something like one out of 3,000. And, of course, they did. And there's been a lot of soul-searching on the part of people making probabilistic forecasts. Um, is it really one out of 3,000 and we just got really unlucky more than once in the last, you know, 50 years? Uh, or maybe, going forward at least, we better start predicting there's a higher chance than that. Not one out of two, but maybe one out of a thousand, or maybe one out of a hundred, who knows. So, so a lot of people are, again, thinking, rethinking what they should use as probabilities for different investment outcomes when they try to tell Ron, if you keep doing what you're doing with your 401k, Here's the chance you will have a happy retirement. Ron will never retire. So, um, and, and so I think, again, nobody can prove it. We're talking about the theory in financial economics is about the future, probabilities of things that could happen in the future. It's not about what happened in the past. And people in the industry and academics, to a major extent, have taken the easy way out and assumed that the frequency with which things happened in the past is probably a good enough assumption as to the probability of similar things happening in the future. And I think, you know, we're all remembering to go back and read the, the beginning papers and textbooks that said, no, 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 it's about the future. And you've got to use whatever information you get your hands on to make the best probabilistic forecasts of outcomes in the future when you project an investment outcome range or when you advise somebody as to how to invest and save. So a lot of soul searching going on in the investment counseling, investment consulting, investment forecasting industry, at least the part that actually uses some of the theories uh, developed in academics. And I might say a lot of first class financial economics has been developed over many years now in the industry. Uh, as well as in academics. We have time for one more question. Um, how would you uh, explain Warren Buffett? Is he smarter than anybody else in the <coughs> room, or is he just lucky? Oh, good. I can answer with an anecdote. Uh, which, uh, <coughs> many, many years ago, and it was many, Jim will probably remember when, uh, Business School has an advisory council of movers and shakers in the business world that come together and I've always suspected they come together to form cartels, but I don't know that. <clears throat> anyway, they come together to advise the school. And, and I was a young professor at the Stanford Business School, and R.J. Miller, our then dean, said, well, I'd like you to address this group and tell them about this efficient market capital asset pricing model stuff. So I did. And finished. And R.J. turned to me and said, well, OK, how do you explain Warren Buffett up here? And Warren Buffett was sitting up there. And I said, I believe I said, well, I think Warren Buffett is a three sigma um, event. Three sigma, for those of you who know about probability distributions, is a very rare occurrence. And uh, Warren subsequently told that story. And I think it got up to five sigma in the retelling. <laughs> <clears throat> um, here's the problem. You know, if you have, you know, 100,000 monkeys, <laughs> no, none of them will type the Gettysburg Address. Uh, but one of them is going to have a stellar investment record. <laughs> and how do you really know if that's because that was a really smart monkey or one who was repeatedly lucky? Now, Warren has not always made money. He's lost money. That being said, I personally think he's really smart. And uh, I don't think if you're in financial economics, you have to believe that there is nobody who can beat the market 
more often than not. Um, but I think it's helpful to believe there are very few of them, and it's really hard to identify who they are before the fact, and besides which they may charge you a lot of money. And I think I'd like to end on that. Bill Sharp, thank you very much. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.